All right. We are here with Jeff King, monster guitar player in Nashville. Uh, good to have you on the podcast, Jeff. Great to be here, Darren. Thank you. Uh, talked with a good friend of yours last week, Mr. Steve Brewster, and uh, had an awesome conversation. And uh, he always had a lot of great things to say about you. And I know you guys done a lot of sessions together, uh, but we had an awesome conversation. What a great guy. Yeah, Steve's a great guy. He's a great drummer and very musical. And, uh, you know, we've been friends for many, many years and done thousands of uh, recording sessions together. Yeah, I it was going it was when I was doing a bit of research, and went through all music and I went through all music uh, with uh, Steve Brewster. I could see a lot of the, the same yeah, things pop up. So, oh, you guys played together in that one. Oh, you guys played together in that one. So, yeah, yeah, that's generally how it yeah. works. Yeah. So, how are things there with you during uh, all this shenanigans with COVID and all that stuff? How's your life oh. been uh, since that's all come down? Well, you know, uh, first couple months, of course, everybody panicked, sounded like everybody else in the world, I'm sure, and uh, yeah. all the studios shut down, and uh, all the we were actually in. Um, in rehearsals to do uh, start uh, like a multi weekend tour with Reba McIntyre, and they sh- came in and shut down the t- the rehearsals, and then the, um, of course the studios all shut down at the same time, and you know uh, I think most of us that have home studios were really thankful we had a home studio at least yeah. to keep us busy just doing writing stuff or. Or, or working on stuff that we were behind on trying to get caught up. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's certainly been interesting. Like I'm sure in every other uh, aspect of everybody's job, it's uh, certainly taken its toll, you know, financially and mentally on, on everybody, you know, and our whole, our whole system shut down for, yeah. for a while. Um, and it's, know, it's all- flaring up pretty bad in your area again too, right? Well, all through the U S it's, it's pretty bad. Yeah. It's coming back pretty hard down here. Uh, I actually had it a little over a month ago. Uh, I caught it at a recording session where there were six of us in the band, and we all um, ended up testing positive. And out of the six of us, there were so many, there were just varying degrees of um, severeness. You know, one guy actually ended up really, really sick and is still sick, and the rest of us are pretty much, you know, uh, 85 to 100% back, you know, just depending on. But, you know, I'm lucky that, that we all, except for the one dear friend who's still recovering, you know, we're all, we're all good. Just, uh, it's know. pretty funny how it hits everybody completely different. You do, that's the weird thing is you just have no idea how it's going to affect you. And some people fly through it and, and, yeah. um, I know I was touching base with, uh, I'm friends with Mickey Gilly and, and he, he just got it, um, a week yeah. or two ago and you think someone you know his age and um you know that would hit him really hard um uh, and he just flew through it and it's like bam he was out doing a show a week later <laughs> wow wow yeah amazing good for him yeah, yeah i know you hear someone like that getting you get really super worried and that's like right. um but yeah some people uh, it's fine and that, that's the scary yeah. thing about it i think it's just like not knowing how it's going to affect you you know when you get a cold Right. You kind of have an idea what the cold's going to be like. Right, yeah. <laughs> Even if you get the flu, you know, you're going to be bad for a few days and it's, you know, going to have a headache and a fever. And, but, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a scary thing. But hopefully, uh, it's a good th- probably nice to know that you've actually got through it and yeah. not as stressed about catching it again. Um, right, yeah. We're, we, you know, we feel good that we're, we, we've gotten through it without, much trouble. There are the five of us. And then, uh, and then now, you know, we kind of feel like we're probably pretty safe to be around other people because, you know, we, we're probably not going to bring it to them. You know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's just, but uh, like everybody, like the rest of the world, we're all ready for it to be over down here. It's just life needs to get back to normal, whatever that means, you know, I know. <laughs> whatever that's going to be again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, it was funny. I was talking to, uh, John Cowan yesterday, uh, uh-huh. and he said, yeah, he's supposed to have been out playing with the Doobie brothers this summer on a big 50th anniversary tour. And, and he said it's the first time in 40 years that he's been home in the summer. Right. Uh, and he yeah. was saying the weird thing was he, at this point, getting back on the road, doesn't sound too thrilling to him. He's, he's enjoyed being back home so much yeah. and having yeah. that time and that 
thing that you've never had a chance to have. Um, mm-hmm. That you know, he, he says, "Hope yeah. no one hears this." But <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I I do understand. You know, it, um, you know, I said when when the shutdown occurred, it was great for all of us to have our own home studios. Yeah. But to be honest, there was so much going on that I kept thinking, I don't want to go down. I'm just not. I don't feel like doing it right now you know yeah. there's so much we were just trying to grasp any kind of information we could get on what's going on in the world and you know that's just i just didn't unfortunately i just didn't feel like sitting down playing guitar you yeah know? But, so you're playing on the award show um that's tomorrow and uh tonight. so what's on the house band there uh that's probably a fun gig it's really fun i've done it before it's yeah. it's it's a lot of fun and uh a lot of quick turns. <laughs> yeah. <know? laughs> so what's, what's it like now? Obviously you've done a bunch of times and, uh, what's the procedure like, uh, now for them? I know they're, um, they're pretty tight with testing and all that stuff. And yeah, how's, well, how's that um, work there? You know, we just did, um, a couple of us were in the CMA Christmas band as well. And we just filmed that, uh, about a, well, we filmed it before I, I actually got COVID. So, you know, we had, uh, I think the filming was on it was on Tuesday. So Friday morning we had a test and Monday morning we had a test. So we had to have, had to have two negatives to even get in the building. Yeah. And, um, then we are in a building and then you wear a mask the whole time and you sit in the green room and, you know, I mean, we would sit in there for hours and yeah. they kind of want to keep you in the green room, but you know, in a normal year, you're kind of in the green room, but there are more people there and there are more bands and you know, more people and you're kind of always in the hall and moving around, you know, but yeah, yeah. and the, this year, you know, it's, uh, it's not at the arena. It's at the, um, um, so whatever the, the big thing is down there beside the arena. Yeah. The convention uh, center there. The convention center, yeah, yeah. and uh, and it is uh, really segregated off because the, everybody wants they want everybody to stay separate, so they, you know, nobody's. It's probably a smart place because there would be so many rooms, meeting yeah. rooms in a place like that. Where an arena, you only have so many spots. Um, rooms, right? Yeah, but in uh, convention room, they can really cordon off multiple areas and and really just bring people out when they need to and and. Yeah. Uh, it's probably smart, the smartest place to have that. But yeah, you probably miss the, you know, the chatting and the, and hanging out with the guys and gals. And, um, that's kind of the award shows are really good for that stuff. And, uh, Oh yeah. It's lots of times that you run into people you haven't seen in a year, you know, Yeah. but for whatever reason, you've been really good friends with at some point you've crossed paths or been in a band together with somebody or, but yeah, but, but it, it's going to be great this year. Um, I was telling my wife, she said, well, who, um, who are you going to be able to play with? And I said, well, uh, I said, we're going to, we're going to be playing with Charlie pride. And I'm really excited about oh, that. Nice. I know Charlie really well. I, uh, yeah. I work on his tour, all of his Canadian tours up here. Oh, do you? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, he's, he's awesome. He sings great still. I mean, yeah, he sure does. Yeah. And he, you know, he really gives her, I mean, it's not, you know, He's not calling at home. He's, you know, no. he no. loves every minute of it. And um, he's still having a great time. Yeah. 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 I did a bunch of shows with him uh, the last few years and, wow. and, uh, you know, sat and had dinner with him a bunch of times and that. And, yeah. and, uh, yeah, don't, he, he's a guy you don't want to get stuck in a room chatting with because you'll be there for 10 <laughs> hours. <laughs> That's great though. Isn't it? Oh yeah. I, all of a sudden I remember being at a show and we were, uh, we broke for dinner and we were uh, sitting next to one another. He started asking me questions and he started talking about his career and, and he likes to quiz you and, yeah. and test you out a bit. And well, I don't know, 20 minutes later, I, I look up and the place had just deserted. Like the guys <laughs> took off. Oh, and I, right. yeah, I yeah. like, oh crap. I mean, it's just me, yeah. but it was, no one, no. yeah, it was cool. I mean, like what type of, you know, how many people would love to have that kind of conversation uh, oh, yeah. with Charlie? So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, I know, uh, He's being inducted, right? Is uh, uh, always, yes, it's all, like some type of um, so, yeah. Um, well, is it, it might be a lifetime, lifetime achievement yeah. or something like that, I, or the Willie 
I can't remember. Yeah. Yeah. At that point there was a lot going on and we were trying to dodge things coming down and coming across and you know, yeah. all that stuff. He's doing uh I know I heard he's doing Kiss an Angel. Um uh-huh. is he they said they might do more tonight. Is he doing more uh, another song or just that? Yeah. That I think that's all we're doing with yeah. him. That's all we know. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he may be on his own. <laughs> well that's cool. Uh you'll enjoy that for sure. Yeah. So Let's kind of go back. I know uh, you, as a, a career in in Nashville and playing guitar and looking at everyone's you, you've you've played with, it's it's the list is, is pretty astonishing. And you've been playing guitar for Reba for uh, quite a few years now, and and uh, that must be pretty. I actually have seen you a couple of times. I saw you up in uh, Casino Rama, north of Toronto. Oh yeah, uh, that's a great casino there. Um, yeah, great spot. So I've seen you there. I think once or twice and. And it's funny because you you actually there's a guitar player up here in Canada who's won the CCMA Guitar Player of the Year a bunch of times. His name's Wendell Ferguson. Uh-huh. And you guys from a distance could be twins. <laughs> it's every time I see you, it's like, hey, that's Wendell. <laughs> that's Wendell, my buddy. Wendell. That's funny. <laughs> I'll have to send you a picture. Um, uh, he's got longer hair now, so it's not so much. But yeah. kind of back in the day, uh, yeah, you guys are like twins and he's, he's, oh, he's a great right. great guitar player but so anyways you you grew up in 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 tennessee right i grew up in east tennessee a little town little town called towns in tennessee up in the mountains um we were the the last town before you entered the smoky mountains uh, oh, nice. on at one of the entrances and um it was a great place to grow up and you know did a lot of fishing and hiking and camping and all that stuff as a kid so it was a it was wonderful. Yeah, nice area around the Smoky Mountains are beautiful. Mm-hmm. Beautiful up there. When did you uh, when did you get the itch to play guitar? Was the was that the first thing you started uh, on a guitar? It was uh, well, you know, my mom probably like a lot of us made me take piano lessons. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, after a couple of years, uh, I, I said, you know, I'm, just, I'm not. I, this is really cool, but I'm really. I'd really rather play guitar because yeah. I've just been drawn to it. Um, and uh, there was a, um, there's a lot of music in my family, although my grandmother played piano and my mom played piano, but I can't, you know, there are a couple, a um, couple other, like I had a couple uncles that or one, one uncle that played guitar some, you know, around the house, he'd play folk songs and stuff like that. And um, you know, when I heard, I don't remember what year this was, but the, the thing that really made me go, wow, this, I want, I love this is uh, when I heard uh, Dobie Gray sing drift away and I heard the guitar parts on there, which was my, our dear friend, Reggie Young, who we lost last year. But, yeah. uh, you know, I, I just, re- I remember sitting there listening to the 45 on my aunt's record player going, man, this is the coolest thing. You know, I've, n- I've never heard anything like this. And years later, um, uh, in the session world, I got to do several sessions with Reggie, uh, oh, wow. and it, he was just a gracious gentleman and a wonderful, wonderful guitar player. And, um, you know, I can't say enough good things about him. You know, he, did you get a chance to tell him kind of that oh, you, yeah. Yeah. I told him that. And he, he, we actually had got to have a little conversation about the Dobie gray record. And he was telling me that, and if I remember this correctly, because it was uh, several years ago, I think he said, you know, that, that was a little something I was working on and you know how you play things while you're warming up for a session year or whatever, you're just sitting around kind of noodling. And he said, I'd have been, I've been noodling on this thing for a while. And when it came time to this song, he said, we need an intro. And he went, oh, what if it's something like this? And he played the the parts and it was, wow, that's, that's Dolby, uh, Drift Away wouldn't be the same without that all that beautiful stuff on there. Yeah. I may have the story wrong, but that's how I remember it. <laughs> <laughs> that's you, know, good. Stuff, you know how that goes. <laughs> well, it's a cool thing about the music industry, especially when you're young and you get inspired by something like that. And then you get to sit in the room uh, later on and play and perform or meet someone like that. That's right. You know, that's always pretty life changing. I always find that's just those moments are pretty cool. It sure was. I'm going to turn off my mail. So I tell yeah. you that. Um, 
Yeah, it's um I mean he was just one of those guys that um I remember uh there's a great steel player down here, Paul Franklin, and we were doing a record and they had brought Reggie in because they wanted to cut one song live that Reggie had played on the original it and it was an old uh, Waylon Jennings song. I think it was called I think the title was Ain't Living Long Like This, which we all know right. down here from playing yeah. club for so long and and they said, well, you know, we've had, we've got Reggie in today uh, and because we want to try to cut this live. And we're like, oh, hey, we played this. All Everybody has played this song hundreds of times differently, yeah. <laughs> you know. So let's let's get a version. And and Reggie came out to uh, Paul and I and he said, hey, you guys just you just guys do what you do and, and I'll play something around you. And we're like, OK. And uh, I remember when we finished the song, I remember looking over at Paul. And I said, you know. We played between the two of us. I think we played every Reggie lick there is to play, and he still played something different back there. <laughs> we just couldn't help us. I mean, I didn't realize how you know his tasteful style had integrated with our business. Yeah. You know, it was just a just really cool. And he was just ever so gracious, always. So, so, so going back, you you went from piano and, and got going on guitar. Did you have? Uh, a guitar teacher? Did you have someone that got you going or did you learn on your own? Well, I had um, a family friend in my hometown. There was a band called the Sullivans. And my friend Ronnie Sullivan said, hey, I'll come out and teach you some chords. And he came out, taught me a few chords and taught me how to play the Wildwood Flower. Oh, yeah. uh, and, you know, just kind of got me started. Um he actually got me far enough along. Uh, he was more, he would play a acoustic guitar to accompany him himself singing. So yeah. he was more the quarterly thing. And, you know, maybe a few little bluegrass songs where I could find the melodies. Uh, but it really helped me to start hearing things a certain way. And then, then I started digging into um, to records and, you know, I remember the Eagles, the long run coming out and that, whole record had just a wealth of, you know, really tasteful guitar playing on it. So I, yeah. I, so I would dig in and I would learn stuff as, as note for note as I could. Yeah. You know, time. So without a computer um, to slow things down and stop. Oh, them, really. yeah. No, no, we got it. We got it made now. <laughs> I know. <laughs> there, you have the amazing slow downer. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I just, all you could do is slow the record down a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. And then you have to find it another key. key and, yeah. yeah right. <laughs> so do you remember what your first guitar was? My first guitar was a K guitar. Well, actually back up. My first acoustic was a little, um, you know, cheap little plywood acoustic that really hurt my fingers as oh, I yeah. pushed it, you know? Yeah. And then I moved up to another plywood acoustic that hurt my fingers still. I think my folks thought that we were, we were moving up and, uh, yeah. and, you know, probably getting a nicer looking guitar, but, uh, but anyway, it didn't matter. You know, I just played till my fingers hurt and then couldn't play anymore. And then, um, then, then they bought me a, a Fender Vibro Champ, which oh, yeah. was super cool. And they bought me an electric guitar for Christmas one year, maybe when I was 12, 11 or 12. And, um, the K guitar had a Bigsby type thing on the end of it. Yeah. Um, and I spent a lot of time with that. And I think later on, and my next one was, a uh, a copy of a Les Paul. And then, then I, you know, I, then just, I don't know. Yeah. Just I, snowballed. After that. <laughs> snowballed after that. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, obviously in school, in the high school and that, um, did you have a band that you were playing in, in, in school that you, or were you just kind of working on things your own? Well, it, when I was in high school, I played a lot of sports, so I would just play guitar in between all that stuff. Oh, yeah. And, um, and then, uh, everything kind of kicked in musically at the beginning for me. Uh, when I went to college, I went to East Tennessee state university and, um, uh, I, uh, re I graduated with a degree in engineering from up there and, um, yeah. a friend of mine, um, knew some guys and he said, Hey, let's get a band together. And the singer in the band lived right in the town there, uh, in Elizabethan, which was one town over. And he said, Hey, I think I can get us, a, uh, some gigs at the, uh, 
at the Elks Lodge here. We could probably play the Elks Lodge, the Moose Lodge, you know. Yeah. And those are Friday and Saturday night gigs, and they pay good. Yeah. And, and my friend and I, his, his name was Jeff Coppage, uh, after the first gig, we thought, man, we can make $30 a night. This is insane. <laughs> you know, we're in college, and we're making $30 a night. Yeah. <laughs> so we – we started doing that and, you know, we got pretty busy up there and we were learning songs and we we're just kind of a country top 40 band, you know, and uh, God, we had so much fun and it just, you know, it, then it got its hook, I guess, in me, what you would say. And then, yeah. and then I really just wanted to do that more and more because I loved playing. And, so did you, you know, think in high school or when you were, uh, post high school, uh, taking engineering that music was going to be the thing you did or is it still I'm, I'm going to be an engineer or do engineering and that's going to be my solid thing and I still like playing guitar or, uh, or is it something that you kind of knew it was going to be your well, life work you know I that's a good question because I didn't really know I, I really wanted to be I thought I wanted to be an architect so oh. because I always loved structures and building and all that stuff but but you know, music with, goes with—I mean, uh, math goes with architecture, and also goes with music and all that stuff. So, yeah. I'd always loved music and playing guitar. And um, so, when I graduated, I moved to Nashville just because I thought, well, I'll just move down there and see what's going on. And uh, I actually tried to get a job using my degree, but I couldn't find a job because I had no experience. And you know, yeah. You get experience with, you know, how to <laughs> yeah. like that. So I finally got fed up with it all and answered an ad in the paper for a band that was looking for a guitar player uh, and met some great folks. And we went out on the road and spent the next two years out traveling together. So we did the, a lot of states, went way up into Canada and we were, we were on the, we were on the West side of Canada, played Calgary and yeah. uh, Edmonton mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Saskatoon, Saskatoon yeah. Regina and, Lethbridge. I don't remember if it was Lethbridge or Winnipeg, probably. Probably, yeah. but we also played the little ones like Medicine Hat, yeah, Brooks, yeah. Alberta, and all those little, little places. So, uh, so that, that was a great place for me to be because I was still learning how to play and trying to figure out a lot of stuff. So, so what type type of band was that? Just a country, a, another kind of country kind top forty yeah. party band, you know, just sort of a thing. We were playing, you know, four or five sets a night, five six nights a week. So, yeah. We're getting our playing time in. Well, that's the thing. You know, we've talked about this on the podcast before. Back in those days, uh, that's where you really got good as a band. You're playing basically every day yeah. um, for hours. And, you know, Saturday matinees or sometimes Sunday matinees. Or then, yeah, right. then you know, the next town and away you go again. And, you know, you just don't get to play like that uh, for a lot of bands nowadays learning. There's not the gigs um, like that anymore. Right. But. Uh, yeah, especially especially in Western Canada, man. There was that was a lot. Of, that was a big touring for for uh, country clubs were really big out there. Yeah, we would go up there sometimes for you know two and a half months at a time and just do those circuits around through there and then come and then hit a few on the way home so we could you know didn't have to drive the whole way at one time and awesome. Then we do it again. <laughs> yeah, where you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so from there. Uh, would would you find you kind of finally got your first? I wouldn't say that wasn't a legit gig, but your first kind of bigger gig um, playing after that. Right, you know um, that kind of came to an end. I mean, like things do, and everybody was just getting tired, and yeah. we were all trying to figure out what what the next step with the band was, or maybe you know off on our own, whatever. So we decided. I'm not really can't really remember. There was no event. Everybody, we kind of all went our way as friends, you know, Hey, let's yeah. take a break, do some other stuff. And, uh, my same friend that I was with, uh, in the band in college, my friend, Jeff Coppage had moved to Nashville probably a few years before I did to go to M middle Tennessee state university, which is in Murfreesboro, about 30, 40 minutes from here. And, uh, he was interning for some, uh, pretty big time engineers in Nashville and they were cutting big records and, um, he called me one day and he said, Hey, uh, I've been working on a record with this, with this girl. She's a really great singer. Her name is Patty Loveless and they're going to put a band together. Uh, she's never 
had a country band. I think she'd done some rock stuff before and been in different bands, but yeah. if they want to put a touring band together and, and, you know, I thought of you cause you know, you just got here and I'd, you know, just come off the road with the other band. So, yeah. um, I said, yeah, that sounds great. And he said, I'll put you in touch with her manager. So, uh, we set a date and we, uh, I, I walk, walk into the rehearsal space and there's, um, you know, three or four guys were all setting up and I'm thinking, was well, this an audition or I'm not sure what, what this is here. But as we set up, I realized there's a, an acoustic player, a bass player, a drummer, a steel player and myself. And I'm thinking, well, I mean, we're, we're a band. Yeah. And so Looks Patty like comes in and <laughs> she says, you know, Hey, let's talk. And we talked for a while. And it's like, okay, let's, you guys, why don't we, uh, why don't we do a couple of these songs because we had given, been given the material ahead of time. So, so we played a few songs and, you know, we kept this spot, which is, was in the attic of a publishing company yeah. down in Nashville. And, uh, and we had, uh, we just started rehearsing. Maybe we rehearsed for a couple of weeks until we got her first record kind of under our hands. And, yeah. uh, then we started doing a few dates and, and for me, you know, I'd been playing a long time, but I'd never been in, in front of these kind of crowds. So yeah, I was pretty nervous about it, but that was, um, probably, 1985. Oh yeah. Did she hit so, quite soon when that album came out? Was she, uh, uh, did she have hits right away or did it take a bit? I think she started, you know, times were different back then because, you know, there was no Spotify and all that. Yeah. Apple music. Uh, I think she did pretty well the first, within the first couple of years, yeah. you know? Um, and then, um, then it just kept building after that. You know, we started in a van pulling a trailer and then we ended up with, you know, two or three buses and, or when I left and I think I left in 91. Oh, yeah. So Probably. again, you know, those times in your life and in your career where you feel like, okay, I'm starting to feel like something else is pulling me here and I'm, yeah. you know, need to move and do whatever it is that, that that's next on the list. So Probably had a Silver Eagle bus back then. When oh, we, we had a silver eagle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Probably with some type of pitcher on the side or yeah. there was yeah. always that. <laughs> that was a, certainly a big thing with the eagles. Or yeah. The, you know, horses with a carriage or something. That's exactly know. right. Yeah. We may have had a horse on the side. I can't remember. I remember it being green, but I don't remember what else. But yeah. yeah. Cool. So after, after, uh, Patty, you found yourself probably back in Nashville there. Um, uh, yeah. Did you get into, when did you find yourself getting into the recording uh, part of it? Must have been not too far after that. Well, you know, that's kind of why I left because I was like 89, 90, I started getting there maybe even, you know, earlier, 87, 88. I would get a call for a session ever occasionally because someone didn't show up or got double booked or something. Yeah. And I started thinking, you know, I really want to do more of this. So how do I figure out how to do this? And, and when you work for an artist like that, it's a, it's a great thing. Uh, but you know, you leave like if, uh, in the summer, sometimes we do three and four day weekends. So, yeah. you know, we might leave Wednesdays and get home Sunday and, and, you know, if you get called for a session Thursday morning, it's, there's just no way to make it work. You know, yeah. you, you have to be in, you know, Des Moines on Thursday night. So there's just, you can't get there, you know? Yeah. So, um, I started thinking, well, I don't want, I'm, I feel like I need to move on. And, you know, I had talked with Patty a little bit about that because she was just wonderful, still is a wonderful person and a, and a dear friend. And so as they would do back in those days that before they would do a record, a lot of times they would go in the studio for two or three days Yeah and sort of define the parameters of the songs, like get, make sure they knew the right key, make sure they explored some tempo options. Yeah. And um, so I, you know, I started getting called to go do those things with her. So, so I, I was learning a lot about recording doing that. And then, and then I'd get the records back and hear what, like a lot of times at that point, it was some of the time it was Reggie and some of the time it was Albert Lee or, yeah. or Ray Flack, you know, who yeah. played all the Ricky Skagg stuff and um, just a bunch of great, great guitar stuff on those records. And, and I was able to compare like, okay, well, here's the version that I did and here's the version they did. 
I can definitely improve and, and figure out how to think more, Yeah, you know, about going in the studio. So, uh, but she kind of knew that's what I wanted to do. And, um, you know, I just, I remember calling her up after Christmas one year, I think, and, um, maybe in 90 or 90 or 91. And I said, I just feel like I really need to, to move, to move on and do something different, you know? And she was like, well, you can stay here as long as you want, but I feel fully support you if that's what you want to do. Um, and she was married to Emery Gordy, who was a great bass player, a great producer at the time. And she said, you know, you should call Emery and tell him you're now available. Yeah. <laughs> for some, <you> know? yeah. <laughs> but luckily I started getting into more stuff because I was in town and readily available to go do stuff. So, yeah, that's the thing, right? When you're out of town and you're touring a lot uh, and you're just gone, there's just someone else that takes your place or you kind of get forgotten about to some degree. Um, mm-hmm. You kind of yeah. have to be available and ready to do it. Um, I think nowadays you probably would know better there than me. It's, it's a little easier to, to carry a live gig and do sessions. Um, yeah. But probably in the 90s because there was so much going on. Um, right you really had to, to be there. Um, you had to pick one. Yeah. Really. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, cause there, there really were, was live players and there were yeah. session guys right. and it didn't cross too much. Um, too much. It didn't right. Nowadays they do. Um, mm-hmm. I think a lot more. Um, yeah. but back then I think it was pretty, you know, uh, these guys play on the album and you don't. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, and plus there were so many records, being made that all the studio guys were really busy yeah. and there were so many artists touring that all the touring guys were really busy. So you, you know, either, I mean, you weren't in town long enough to, to try to plant your seeds in the recording business if you were gone all the time. Yeah. So yeah, uh, it's good work for everybody. Yeah. 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 It's a good thing going on there, but. So obviously you, you, you did well with staying in, in Nashville and, and doing recording gigs and, and all that. Uh, when did you when did you feel that you really felt like you've got your feet planted on the ground and this is this is mm-hmm. really happening? Was it nerve wracking, <laughs> kind of, you know, doing some some of the first bigger gigs and and uh, getting in there, or does it just feel really super comfortable? Uh, well, you know, I started um, at that point. There were there were lots of publishing companies. Yeah. And they were doing demos, which are basically little records, yeah. right? Um, so I started doing a bunch of that stuff. And when I got really busy, uh, in the you know initially, I was doing tons of demos, and 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 it was really great because you, you walk into a, a session, which is down here at three every three hours is a session. So yeah. start at ten finish at one, start at two to five, five. and yeah. six to nine, and then sometimes. 10 until 1 a.m. Yeah. Uh, and the demos were just, I mean, it was a mill. It was just, there's so much work and, and we were working all the time, but also we were playing all the time and you would show up one day and somebody would throw uh, like a sort of a country ZZ top song at you and you'd have to pull out your Les Paul. You might not go that far, but you know, yeah. the, the ideas were similar. And then you would, somebody would throw a, a chicken picking thing like, or a Ricky Skaggs highway 40 blues thing at you. It would be the next song. So you were always switching sounds and, yeah. and amps and guitars and pedals and all kinds of stuff. And really, it's really interesting learning time at that point. But, and then as that happened, you would play on a demo and somebody would want to cut that song. And, and sometimes they would go, Hey, I really love the guitar on this song. I really love the, the tone and, and the notes, the choice of notes and stuff. Yeah. You know, we've got a great band booked, but can we get this guy in to play on this song? And so, you know, I would go in and maybe play on two or three songs or they'd book me for a session. Yeah. At that point, the records were being booked like you book a week at a time, mm-hmm. and, you know, stay in somewhere for a week or maybe two weeks, depending on how many songs they wanted to get. And, and you know, they might say, hey, we, can you come in and do Tuesday? You know, yeah. because whoever's producing wants, wants your sound on this song yeah. and you should know it, but you should know it, but it was probably done like nine months ago and, yeah. and you've probably sold everything that you've had and got <laughs> all the gear by then. 
<laughs> it's like, that was me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or sometimes you go, oh, that wasn't me. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> but I can play that, but yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> so, but you know, that, that's what you want to start happening. And, and then, you know, as you're in with that group of players, you're always networking and making friends and, you know, so uh, the, you know, if you get called on a few of those things and maybe the producer's more comfortable calling you for half of the next record or maybe the next record, because, yeah. you know, you've been around and he kind of feels comfortable knowing what you can do. So it's interesting. Uh, demos back then, a lot of them just ended up that not necessarily was the album, but they, yeah. they didn't, wouldn't change a lot in the demo lots of times. Right. They, yeah. I mean, those, producing and playing on those demos, you were actually creating those parts sometimes that they would just all of a sudden copy or get like someone you to come back in and play it again. Yeah, and it, yeah. a lot of those didn't really change a whole lot. Um, right. So yeah. yeah, it's really, it was, I think that was important work. Um, uh, you know, it's it, interesting that sometimes we would get called and they would say, you know, just the groove on this record is, is, is super cool. We want to try to recreate this. And, what they didn't know sometimes is that that track might have been cut at like five minutes until one o'clock when we all had to be somewhere else at two oh, yeah. and try to grab lunch on the way. So it it was cool because it was a little sloppy, but that's because everybody was trying to do their best, but still think about, you know, packing yeah. up and getting out the door and where you're going next and all that stuff. But yeah. So it's pretty fun. It was a lot of fun back then and, and it's still fun now. It's just a different thing now. So Yeah, totally. So would you, looking back there when you were doing that, was there a spot or a session that you got to that you figured, okay, this is, you know, I'm really big time now, or, you know, <laughs> you know, that time, that one, uh, that one album you're playing with that kind of just kind of makes you go, wow, I'm actually playing on this. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's so much obviously, but sometimes there's that moment where you just kind of go, holy smokes, I'm doing this now. Well, there's, for me, there were moments of, of uh wow this is this is really cool like um you know hearing uh hearing randy travis in your headphones while you're playing and you're going wow you know yeah i've heard this voice so long and now i'm hearing it now and uh or reba or faith hill or you know one of the big ones for me um where there were two well they've all been big ones for me but yeah. um i did one with um uh art garfunkel Oh, it was a trio he was in. And I remember sitting there getting ready to play. And as I'm playing the first verse somewhere, I'm going, I can't believe this is Art Garfunkel. And it sounds exactly like him, you know. Yeah. And he's singing very quietly, but he's got the reverb. And it's just, I'm just going, wow, how cool is this? All I have to do is not screw it up. You yeah. know, <laughs> try to play something interesting and cool, not screw up, you know. <laughs> so. So take us through a, a tip, especially in the '90s, where you're pounding that stuff out quite a bit and had multiple sessions a day. Uh, what was the approach on a on a, a typical session coming in? You obviously would get together, hear a song, gather and jump in and play. Um, right. But what was your typical thought in in a session? Did you have an approach you always used to take, or was it was you know, all different. Well, I think a lot of things were different. You know, um, when I first got started, I met a friend, uh, still a long time friend that, uh, he was in a, working at a publishing company and, uh, as kind of the A and R guy, you know, finding new music, producing the demos and stuff. And he said, he said, you should go listen to as much music as you can. Uh, not like tomorrow, but like generally speaking, to, like go learn a little bit of every style that you can get a hold of. Yeah. And for me, you know, that meant, you know, the chicken picking thing. That meant the kind of the pop rock thing. That meant swing stuff. That means kind of some of the more jazzy type things. But I mean, not necessarily like bebop, but, you know, because stuff is going to be thrown at you on sessions yeah. and it's some one day you're going to get a song like whatever you can imagine, you know? Um, and you know, on the George Strait stuff, you know, they're always cutting swing songs on, you know, one or two a record or whatever. And um, so we had to learn, we had to learn to do that. And 
you know, I remember going to uh, what used to be Tower Records down on West End yep. here, and I would go buy a Bob Wills record, and I would go buy, um, you know, try to find a jazz record that wasn't too, like, far, yep. you know, um, but just any of that stuff. And I would go listen to it, and as you're, you know, you come into, uh, you get sounds on a session, and then and then it's like, all right, everybody come in, and let's listen to the first song, and you know, you're getting maybe four or five songs a session. So there's not a lot of time. Yeah. Uh, so you, they write the charts ahead of time. Uh, and we all got to be really, really good at reading number charts. Yeah. Sometimes there are certain occasions, number charts don't work for certain things. And so some, every now and then you see a letter chart, yeah. but uh, most of the time it would be a number chart and you, you would go in and everybody give out the charts and then they'd start playing the song. And, um, and you kind of listen down and, you know, my first thought was always, okay, I don't want to copy anything, but what is a song that's similar to this? Because a part of my thing about learning different styles was if I were going to play like a swing song, yeah. I'd probably get out of 335 mm-hmm. because it had that sound. So what's, what song could I put close to this so I could pick out a sound and to start with? And and sometimes you pick it out and you go with what everybody else is doing, this is not the right thing. Oh, yeah. So, you know, you get better and better at making those choices, the more you do it. But, you know, at the end of the day, you've done that 15 times. Yeah. And, and then plus you've done extra parts. So you've done, you know, generally speaking, you do two parts per, song plus a solo track you know so you're you're closing in on 40 plus choices <laughs> yeah i know the guitar player always gets the short end of the stick because he's the guy who always has to stay behind and do yeah a few yeah. more tracks while everyone takes a break <laughs> yeah, yeah were you typically were one you, day go we got a song and it was mostly acoustic we're more acoustic driven and they wanted an acoustic solo and 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 I remember going in the lobby and I said, what do you, is this what you guys do when you're out here hanging out waiting for me to be done? <laughs> They're like, yeah, we're just talking sports or whatever, you know? So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. so you were typically electric most of the time. Yeah. Mostly I found, I found that to be my chair and mm-hmm. I, you know, I don't know how that happens. I just, um, maybe because I had more electric gear than I did. Yeah. I, I may have had a, a, a maybe two acoustics back then. And, and every now and then I would get called to play acoustic on something, but most of the time it was electric. And, so obviously so. you had cartridge back then. Um, you know, probably Chris, were you probably had crisscrossing sessions oh, at yeah. times. Yeah. So how many guitars would you typically have on a given session uh, during those days? Well, I'd probably carry four or five with me. Yeah. Because depending on, some, you know, you might go to one session that has cartridge and the next one, excuse me, maybe not. Yeah. So might be in a small studio or, you know, where they didn't have a lot of room. Yeah. So I always had a, an amp and a, like a spare pedal board in the back of my truck at the time. And so I'd always have a couple of guitars. And then, um, you know, with cartridge, we had these guitar trunks. So they were big. You could put probably 10, 12 guitars in them and the oh, yeah. lid shut and, you know, crank yeah. shut. So anytime we had cartridge, that would have, that would be there. Plus the ones I had with me. Oh yeah. So, you know, we had, most guys had similar stuff, you know, 12 strings, baritone guitars, a Strat, a Tele and a Les yeah. Paul and a 335 and, you know, whatever oddball things, you know, you might end up with I, mean, I have a mandolin and a oh, yeah. bazooki in there or banjo or something you know just yeah. you never know what I'm gonna be doing so yeah cool and and i remember having a, i had a, a jerry jones sitar oh, for cool. a while. Yeah. that was that was always fun to pull out and ex- experiment with yeah you know? so i remember we were doing a reba record one time and i said to uh david uh, malloy who was producing i said you know i said david about a month ago, we were doing this thing, and um, this guy said, hey, grab your sitar, and instead of power chords, let's use the sitar, but just play it with your thumb. And he said, and we'll double it, and we'll put it on you know, left and right. And yeah. I said, okay. 
So, I, and I was telling David this, I said, so we did that. And I said, it was really interesting. It didn't have the big thing that power cords had. It had a different thing. And he goes, well, we need to do that. We need to try that. So yeah. I remember one day we had finished tracking a song and Reba had finished singing. And she said, hey guys, I'm going to be back. I have to run upstairs to a meeting. Uh, so she left and he looked at me and said, hurry, quick, get your sitar. We got to get this done. <laughs> <laughs> so we did it. And he said, we got to turn it. We got to keep it down just low enough to where she doesn't hear it. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and somehow we, we, we would do sneak stuff in like that all the time. <laughs> That's, awesome. That's awesome. Just trying to make stuff different, you know? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, were you doing any live gigs during that time? Like, were you, you probably were so busy with the studio. Were you, did you, did you do much live or any touring during the nineties? No. Um, Every now and then, uh, I would go sub for somebody if they got sick or if it, if it was an artist that I had been on one of the records, you know, they might call and say, Hey, can you come out and do this? You know, where a guy's sick or he's got to go to a wedding or whatever, funeral, any of that stuff. And, but nothing with a regular, you know, on a regular basis. And, um, it was just too, it was just too much. Yeah. You, know, you couldn't. So moving on into 2000s, uh, obviously recording changed a little bit. Um, and then uh, you, you've got the gig playing live with, with Reba. How did that all come about? Obviously, you played on their albums quite a bit. So I played on a couple of her records, yeah. Um, it was uh, 2006. Um, my wife is a fiddle player, and she was oh, in good. the band. I'm a fiddle yeah. player, too. Yeah, oh, are you really? Yeah, yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> She's a... Well, we were in, um, well, let me start in the beginning. Uh, so I get a call from Reba's manager, who I know from the sessions, he was always there. Uh, and uh, he said, hey, uh, uh, Jerry McPherson, who was the guitar player in the band at that point, said he's leaving. He's you know, going to go do something different, and, and we're going we're gonna to fill that spot. Would you be interested? And I said, I said, let me think about that a little bit. He said, okay, just call me back, you know, in a day or two and, and, and we'll go from there. We just, he said, we just want to go out and have fun, play some shows. You know, it's just, it's just chill, no drama and all this. And I said, yeah. wow, that sounds fun. And of course I knew it was fun because my wife was in the band at the time. Oh, and okay. uh, later on, I think we might've been there for one or two years together, but she left to uh, form with a couple other guys, the a group called the steel drivers, oh, yeah. which is, you know, they're still a fantastic band down here right now. But um, so basically I've been with Reba since 2016 <laughs> or six, six. I'm sorry, yeah. but you know, it's never been a full-time, full-time gig. I mean, we've yeah. done my first year, I think we did 27 dates and it was mostly, uh, you know, five day slots in the, in the summer. So, oh, yeah. you know, there were five, five big giant weekends of stuff. And, I was like, you know, this is pretty fun because after being in the studio for so long, your focus gets kind of whittled down to, you know, looking at something very small, yeah, microscopic to try to perfect every part. And, and being out live, you know, you try to do that, but at some point you just try to have a good time and, and try to play fun music. And, you know, it's fun to be part of a band out there. And, and Reba was always total pro and she was so funny and just awesome. And, you know, yeah. So we, of course we've all missed each other this year. Oh, I bet. We haven't been anywhere, but yeah. So what was that like getting back on the road? Like your first gig, what was that? Like, obviously it would have been, uh, you know, everything has changed quite a bit, uh, yeah. in those years and, um, production all changed and everything. Uh, uh, was well, it? production changed, and and with Reba, we had we you know I had my own guitar tech, and with Patty, we had one guy that did everything, and so yeah. I was like, wow, I have my own guitar tech. Yeah, he just I'd walk in and he had me a guitar with fresh strings on it. It's like, wow, this is so <laughs> cool. <you know? laughs> and my stuff's already set it up, and it's everything's in tune, and yeah, it was, uh, it was a really great time. But um, you know. Um, after working in the studio for so long, you get up and you go work all day and, and, you know, you get to have great experiences with your friends. You play great music and you, you create and you, you get inventive all day. And out there, you know, I find myself, we, we would be in these towns and then 
just go out walking and, and yeah. then play the show at night and think, wow, you know, this is a whole different part of the music business that I forgot about. Yeah. And this is really fun. Yeah. So, you know, that was about the time a lot started changing and you were able to do, you know, both things, you know, so there's a kind of enough going on where you can just, you know, I, every day, I mean, you know, I missed a few things, I missed a few records while I was out, but at the end of the day, you go, you know, I'm working, I'm working. So, yeah. Yeah. Obviously a great gig. If you're going to play someone with someone, uh, I mean, the catalog with Reva is fantastic. A lot of great guitar parts and, yeah. um, great solos and, uh, mm -hmm. great songs. And, you know, I've heard you play, actually, I've heard you, uh, in Vegas as well. Um, play with Reva and, uh, always sounds great. I mean, the band's great. Um, yeah. but, Thank uh, you. Obviously, uh, that's got to be a fun gig. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, it's fun. It's uh, my friend's uh, uh, other guitar player, Jim Kimball, in the show. We call it, we, <laughs> we often say, yes, there's a show within a show going on right now because there's always something going on that no one knows about except for a couple of us up there. And it's yeah. usually playing a joke or somebody had a joke played on them or something's going on. And, you know, sometimes... Reba will catch us. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes. Sometimes. She's doing her thing and we're doing our Sometimes thing. Yeah. <laughs> now Jim, Jim plays the plays acoustic in the, in the band, right? He plays a lot of acoustic. Yeah. yeah there's a lot. Of, yeah. He's a great player. He's a great player. Yeah. 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 So obviously you've done a lot with Reba over the years. Uh, obviously tons of TV stuff and, and live shows. Um, maybe fill us in a little bit when you're doing, you know, one of those late night shows and, and, you know, whether it's Kimball or, or the night show, what are those experiences yeah. like, like showing up at the tonight show and, and, and playing? Um, well, you know, I, with Patty, we did the tonight show and that was when Johnny Carson, it was when Johnny Carson had it, wow. but the first night we did it, Johnny Carson wasn't there. Jay Leno was subbing for him there for a while, you know? Yeah. And, um, uh, I mean, you know, your nerves are raw because if you're a country boy from East Tennessee and then all of a sudden you're on a TV show that you've been watching since you were a kid yeah. and I'm like, Oh my gosh, you know, I can't screw up. I don't want to be one of these guys. And, you know, so you practice, 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 practice. And then you get out there and your nerves are shot and you only rely on muscle memory. You know, the first couple of times for me, it was, it was kind of like that, just trying to rely on, I played, you know, I kept saying, I've played this a thousand times. Yeah. Why should this time be any different? You know, I tr just keep thinking to myself like that, but it's funny uh, how you feel when those TV lights come on, right? Yeah. It's, yeah. it's plays with your head and I've done a bunch. <laughs> so it's, yeah. it's really bizarre. You yeah. could sit there even during rehearsal, everything's fine, but bam, that light comes on and it's like, yeah. right. holy smokes. Yeah. You're, you're just, uh, you're a shell of yourself. You know? Yeah. <laughs> you know, we did, uh, with Reba, I think we've done David Letterman. I, I know we did it once, if not twice. Uh, but the first time I remember uh, my friends that had done it before us so, and they always said, you know, it's really cold in there. Be prepared. Oh, yeah. And it's really cold in there. It's like, okay. Okay. So we get there that day. And uh, we go in for sound check, and all the crew guys are walking around in, you know, hoodies with a hood up and sweatshirts and and coats on and stuff. And I remember going, "This is not bad. I mean, this is we we play outdoor gigs that are colder than this. I mean, it's you know, it's um you know maybe sixty five in there or whatever, a little chilly. But and I remember saying, "Man, it's, my friends told me it was, would be cold." And it's like, "Oh, this no." This isn't it yet. Yeah. And so we left our guitars inside in, uh, inside where the show was, and they, they sent us down to the green room. Yeah. So we're sitting down there getting dressed, and uh, we come up, and they say, okay, you know, three minutes till you go on. You guys go out and, and get your, get your entrance, instruments and get ready and stuff. And I remember picking up my guitar going, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> it was like 57 degrees out there or something. And we're just going, my street, you know, I had a – I had a solo that night on one of these songs and I'm going, the strings don't even bend. They're just, just so cold out here. And you know, you touch the strings with your hand, your hands warm, your strings go flat. 
and then you'd move your hand and they go sharp. I mean, it's like stuff going on like this. And, yeah. and you know, I remember trying to play the solo. I played this a thousand times and, but my fingers are going, ah, I don't know, you know, exactly. but luckily all ended well and, and, and we survived everything, but man, sometimes you think you might be there for two hours and uh, it's an hour, it's an hour and 57 of kind of cool boredom and it's three minutes of sheer terror. Uh, otherwise that you enjoy, yeah. but you're just freaked out for three minutes, you know? Exactly. Most of those are, are tape kind of late afternoon, right? Um, yeah, that was late out. Yeah. Like yeah. five, six, five, five, four, five o'clock, something like that. And then you get some of the, the morning shows like, um, good morning America type shows. Um, yeah. you got to get in. Is it usually done super early or do you go in night before and, and get ready? No, you know, so what's interesting about those is like, Good Morning America or the Today Show, the crew guys have like a 3.30 a.m. lobby call yeah. and they go over and get stuff set up and then the band might have a 5.30 lobby call. So, you know, there's a lot of mandatory sitting around on those kind of shows. You get there at 5.30 and yeah. we'll sound checks at 7.30. Well, boy, it would have been nice if our lobby call would have been seven. seven. Yeah, but now you're here I and know. you don't have to worry about traffic. It's like, oh, well, okay. I, you know, you get the point, but... Well, they've probably uh, done enough times and been on the edge enough oh, times since so we better get everyone here early. <laughs> we better get everybody here early. And, you know, they always have a big spread of all kinds of breakfast foods and coffee and, you know, whatever. But yeah, yeah it's a, it's a lot of fun. It's, I mean, what a great, um, just all, all great experiences. Even when you're so freaked out and nervous about stuff, it's, you look back and you go, man, this has all been really cool. Yeah. So what about sessions nowadays? Um, how different are sessions now than they were for you as a guitar player? Um, you know, in the busy times in the nineties. Probably now everything is a record. Um, you might be hired to do demos, but it's very possible that the demos may become the record oh, yeah. anymore. And, um, you know that, and I work, I work a good bit in my home studio and, get stuff sent to me. I, uh, you know, I don't, I'm just very fortunate that people find me somehow and they send me stuff and I play on things and I've got guys in Australia that, that are really great producers. And, you know, I've played on stuff here in my, at my house and, and they'll, I'll see a link from something and I'll click on it and wow, this is number one down in Australia. It's like, oh. wow, that's cool. I played on that song and you never really know. And, you know, um, I don't know. It's just, uh, it's, it's just different now because I thought demos kind of have been, uh, at one point there were tons of demos and now that's been greatly reduced, yeah. uh, because now there are track guys that kind of do demos at the time, you know, as they're coming up with it, they're doing it on their building. As it goes, yeah. Stuff, yeah. building it. So a lot of that has kind of gone away, but what's, I don't think anybody is going to replace the fact that people are still going to want to come to Nashville to do a record. And because you can, you can do a great record really fast here with great players and great studios and great engineers. And, yeah. you know, it's, it'll sound really, it'll sound like, you know, you can use the same players that you hear on the radio. Yeah. Um, so you can, you can get the great quality. So people still come to town and do all that. So, there's always uh, something going on, you know, yeah. whether it's, um, you know, doing a day of jingles. Um, I just finished a two day thing uh, that were, all the little pieces were like a minute and a half long and you're just building little parts and, you know, some, some of it's for weather, some of it's yeah. Uh, traffic, yeah. you know, some of it's station ID, you know, yeah. you've got a little things you play at the end of them. And uh, so you, so many more ways to to play music in the music business than just demos and records. Yeah. So, you know, Do you find country music obviously is different now um, oh, yeah. than it was? Uh, do you find it challenging at all to uh, think of you know what to play in this new style of uh, music, or is it just you know you just so skillful at that you just figure something out and, and make it work. But, um, it's definitely heavier 
uh, yeah. for guitar stuff, right? It's it's mm-hmm. uh, a lot of heavy, a lot of guitar and, now. Yeah, and, you know, a lot. You're, lots of big. You're in the studio doing a lots of extra tracks. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. it's now of sixteen three tracks. tracks. <laughs> yeah, <all> right. <laughs> well, it's, yeah. Instead of three, you're going okay. Let me put power chords on this first chorus. You fly it, and I'll grab the last two bars of the next one. You know, so yeah. That, I mean, it's moving still fast. You know, but yeah. But yeah, you just you just sort of learn what to do. Um, you know, I think uh, all of this is always some sort of training. Sure, I'm always learning something and. Yeah. Um, you know, for a certain song now, you know, I might call on the engineer to go, Hey, can you put the, this plug in on this and let me play to this. And, you know, and, and that's one way we get a certain sound on a certain record or whatever. And, yeah. you know, um, we've all got pedal boards with the latest, greatest things and, you know, stuff we can control from our phones or our iPad or laptop, whatever. And, yeah. um, so, you know, lots of, uh, synthy type sounds and yeah. it's interesting the guitar world has has moved a little bit over to the synth world um and then the synth world has moved into just sort of a kind of a wacky whole thing now you know yeah um, it's different yeah. So, yeah, it's very <laughs> different it's, it's a lot of fun but you know you still sort of listen to a song and try to what is it going to be to support the song what do i need to be doing and yeah you know it, it doesn't matter it seems like as, as times change, there's still the same job, yeah. but it's just how you get to it. Yeah. You know, like yeah. heavier sounds or what, you know, more delay, more, more spring reverb than we used to use now that now that's back and yeah. you know, whatever makes it cool again. Yeah. So. Cool. Well, we'll finish up on a couple more questions. Um, here's one. Um, I asked Steve Brewster if he had to run out of the house and save a particular snare drum, which one would it be? <laughs> I'll ask you a similar question that kind of stumped them for a while, but, uh, uh, same type of question. If you had to, uh, run out of the house in a hurry and just be able to take one guitar with you, which one would it be? Well, removing all, um, appraisal cost of any of that. <laughs> kind of, I'd probably grab my, my old blue telly, which I've had since 85, that I used with, with Patty Loveless all those years. And it's probably been my main guitar for, you know, even for, for sessions yeah. since then, you know, my main guitar, but I've had, you know, always had a Les Paul's handy and, and other stuff, but, you know, for some reason with that guitar, I feel the most comfortable and I can get tons of sounds out of it. And, yeah, you know, it's just, I'd probably grab that because it means it's a sentimental thing to me, you know, do, do you ever stop buying guitars or is it just something that happens that you just. No, oh. here, I, I don't know if I can, I don't know if you can see oh, any yeah, of that. That's a good list there. <laughs> <laughs> and it goes all the way around. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. That's a bad thing about being a guitar player. You just never stop, you know, fiddle players, you know, <laughs> it's yeah, a, right. Yeah. You're good with yeah. one or two and where you go. Well, you know, a friend said, how about, you know, family members came in town and said, how many guitars do you need? And I said, just one more. I know. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Always one more. Yeah. What but about amp, amp wise? If you had to leave with just one amp, which, which, uh, one would you hmm. want to take? I'd probably, um, you know, for me through my whole career, amps have rotated. I'll yeah. go, I'll use something for a couple of years and then I'll kind of not whether it goes, it, they don't go bad, but you know, you just want to hear something different to refresh yourself a little bit. Yeah. So uh, for a long time I was using, uh, I think my matchless is over here Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I've got a, uh, a tweed, uh, Tremolux over there, like from the fifties. And for a while I used my, um, Marshall JTM 45 and I'd figured out how to use that it's just a great amp and I could take it and use it on it. I could find out how to use it on anything. Yeah. And, uh, but now I'd probably grab, I've got two blonde basement heads and I'd probably grab one of those because that's, that's where I, I'm back to that now. Uh, yeah. you know? and, and, and I also feel a change coming on some of that yeah. stuff, <laughs> which is probably going to cost me another two grand. You know? Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> what about, uh, like 
campers or anything like that? Have you got into any of that type of stuff or are you strictly an amp guy? No, I, you know, with the, uh, on the Reba gig, I have, um, I had the fractal out yep. there, yep. which is an uh, Axe FX three is what I have. And uh, I have one and a spare. And the beauty of that is for that show, it moves really fast. And with the fractal, I can go in and I can take one song and I can program everything I need to program. Yeah. You know, and I have five buttons across it. It's like an intro, verse, chorus, solo, whatever. Yeah. And then the next song, I have all that. And after a few years, you you eventually get a lot of songs programmed in. And so now, I, if she changes the set list, I just drag and drop. And right. they fall right into place. And I know exactly what's going to happen. Yeah. And there's never a, which overdrive was I using on this? Because I like the sound. It's Because it's there. there yeah. it's done. And the, the campers are great. Um, you know, do you know Michael Britt down here? From oh, yeah. Yep. So Michael's been doing the profiling for quite a while. Yeah. Tons of profiling. Yep. And his profiles are slamming great. Just, uh, I don't have a camper, although I've, I've used one on and off for different things. You know, um, I think they're great. Yeah. It's just, it's everything's so accessible with all that stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, but I, I, I still kind of like hearing the thump of an amp and, feeling uh the rawness yeah you know that but i'm not opposed to any of that stuff i mean you've, you've got to figure out what everybody needs to figure out what works for them and there's a place for everything really yeah there's really a place for everything you yeah know? what about um playing live i know you've played all over the place with reba i imagine is there a venue out there that you've never played at before that you've always wanted to play i'm sure reba's covered a lot of them well, we've covered a lot. Um, um, you know, I went uh, to see um, Mark Knopfler um, at the end of last year do a show at Madison Square Garden, and I thought that was really special. Um, a couple of my friends were in the band. Yeah. So, and I think it may have been his last show. Um, but, um, you know, I've never played there. And that's, that's always fun. We played a bunch of different venues in New York, like the the Beacon Theater and different yeah. places like that. But um, not Madison, yeah, no. Yeah, we we never done that. But I don't know. It's just you know, to me, it's man, where wherever you are, it's just fun. Yeah. If you're not having fun, then something's not right. Yeah. You know? <laughs> uh, real quick, couple very short ones. Um, yeah. What about uh, any artists that you haven't performed on a record with or performed with that you you think yeah i'd always wanted to play with that particular person is there anyone on the list that you wish you had a chance uh or still have a chance to play with you know well mark Knopfler was always always a huge influence on me and yeah. hearing him play has you know always meant something to me because i because i feel like he's playing from from a good place and he's you know, it's heart and soul. And then I think the reality of it is, you know, I don't know what I would be doing there watching him play. I mean, but it would be a great thing. Uh, I mean, there's so many different great people. I, I don't, it's hard to pinpoint one thing, but, yeah. you know, but I always loved Mark's music and, and, and what I know of him as a person and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So that'd probably be pretty high on my priority list. He's got a real unique, you always know it's him. I mean, yeah, it's, definitely. It's, it's a tone and it's a style that's not really anyone else I know that plays like him. Right. Yeah. The yeah. whole thing, fingers and yeah. thumbs. And, yeah. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. uh, and one last non-musical question. Um, and it can pertain to being at home or being on the road. Um, do you have a, a go-to uh, food that you, if you're hitting the road and you got a night off somewhere, I got to go for Mexican. I got to go for Italian. I got to go for something. Is there your favorite? Man, you know, our favorite is whatever region we're in. Oh yeah. If we're yeah. if we're in Texas, all right, let's go find a steak place. Yeah. You know, if we're up in the Northeast somewhere, it's like, I mean, when we go to New York, uh, there are guys in the band, and we all go. Okay, we're going to Little Italy to this place that we always go to, which yeah. is uh, um. Bonita, I can't remember the, can't remember the whole. I have to look it up on my phone, but yeah, 
every time we've been to New York, we go to that place and, yeah. you know, get the uh, Italian food. And that's the best thing about touring is eating. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it's great. <laughs> I, I'm more concerned the- about, yeah, I'm more concerned about where we're going to eat after the show or yeah, before the show right. than anything else. <laughs> that's exactly right. And you know, when we go to San Antonio, that that's such a great, that crazy food city. You know, yeah. we, you know, so much great food there. Uh, we have three places we have to go to. There's just look, I woke, we woke up in a parking lot one day in the bus and looked out the window and we're all, it's about nine o'clock and you know, we're tired and hungry. And said, there's a little place called the Oasis over there. And that place we walked in, we thought, well, either we're getting ready to have one of the best meals we ever had, or we're getting ready to die. Yeah. We're not sure what's going to happen <laughs> 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 because you know, it was a little strip mall kind of thing in a downtown area. And you know, there was a, there was a chain link fence across some of the, the businesses there. So that's what made us feel that way. But yeah. they were the most wonderful people. And, and we had a great Mexican breath, breakfast, you know, burritos, wow. yeah. all that stuff. It's, and then she brings the tab and it's like, you know, uh, $10. And yeah. I said, well, I, I was going to get, I was going to get all three guys. She said, no, that's it. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, that's crazy. Yeah. We love to find a little off the wall, hold the wall places, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. That's the best part. Well, thank you uh, very much for being a guest on the podcast. Um, I've always loved you playing and love seeing you live uh, with Reba. And, and uh, do you have anything coming up besides the award show now coming up? You're doing lots of recording at home and um, yeah. I know it's getting close to Christmas and all that fun stuff. It's going to be nice to be at probably at home and oh and yeah, enjoy that. And, Hopefully we'll get back on the road sometime next year. Yeah, I hope <laughs> this ends pretty soon. Maybe the fall. Maybe know. the fall. Maybe they've got stuff. I think they've got they're getting hopeful about booking stuff in the summer. So yeah. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see for sure. Well, yeah. thanks again. And it's a real well, pleasure. And I know everyone's gonna really love listening to this one. <laughs> thanks, Darren. Thanks. Thanks.